Let me say good morning to all of you on this beautiful November the 28th, uh, Sunday morning. It is about 11, or excuse me, 9.25. And in about five minutes, we're going to begin our Sunday school lesson, which is brought by New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church. And for those of you who may not know me, my name is Pastor Rodney Smith, and I am the proud pastor of New Hebron Missionary Baptist Church, where God has blessed me to be for over 14 years now. So I want to ask you to go ahead and get your portion of God's word. Uh, get your adult Sunday school book if you have it. Uh, we're going to be in Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. So if you don't have the Sunday school book, you still can use God's word. You can turn into God's word and you can turn to Numbers chapter 20, and we're going to look at verses 11, excuse me, 1 through 13. If you don't mind when you sign on, uh, if you just want to say hello and good morning to everyone, that way we can greet one another. We have about three and a half, two and a half minutes left before we begin promptly at 930. So uh, to the Morris family, to the Milam family, God bless you. Looks like Brother Larry Howe, bless you, Sister Verdi Davis. Uh, old Jamario, Atlanta Hawks, Brother Tidwell, good morning to you. Uh, Sheila Spearman, good morning. Hope everyone is doing well. I uh, hope you've had a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving. Enjoying time, just relaxing, uh, hopefully having some good food, spending time with family. Uh, hopefully just being able at least for a moment to put your feet up. Uh, for many of us, I think tomorrow, Lord willing, if it comes, we're going to hit the ground running and go back to the normal routine, but it was good just to have a few days off to relax, uh, to lay back, uh, just to recline and just enjoy, uh, hopefully a bit of peace in your homes. So uh, to Sister Clark, good morning to you. God bless you. Sister Turner, good morning to you. Uh, once again, Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13, and I hope all of you had an opportunity to be with us this past Monday when we started the uh, series entitled Conversations with a Local Pastor. We had Pastor Mario Timms with us. We had a wonderful time, wonderful conversation. Maybe there were some things that were brought out uh, responsibility-wise of a pastor that maybe some of you were unaware of, and maybe there were some things you just had never considered. But that was the whole purpose of it all, just to come together and talk and kind of give the congregation and the people at large an inside look at the life of a pastor, the sacrifice that's required, the dedication that's required. And so hopefully that was beneficial to all. Uh, good morning, Brother Alfonso Brown. I pray that you're doing well. Uh, once again, we're going to be in Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. Have a very familiar lesson this morning but yet one that has so many themes and so many lessons that we can learn and glean from it. There, I'm sure there's something for everyone involved in this text for this morning. Go ahead, if you don't mind, and give me your coffee check-in. I'm doing Maxwell House, which is my favorite. Got my vitamin water here. Uh, Going to have me some turkey sausage later on today and some scrambled eggs. And I'll be hitting the road, have to get my son back to college. So uh, I'll be driving, or he'll be driving. So if you all don't see me again, you know he took a wrong turn somewhere. <laughs> but I pray all is going well. Reverend and Sister Austin, God bless you. I see you again, Brother Brown, with the black silk. I'm going to have to try it. I'm, I'm still finishing up what I have, though. Still going to finish up what I have. And so I, I, I pray that when we go through these uh, Sunday school lessons, uh, please make sure that you try to, if it's possible, to minimize or stop any multitasking, if you can. It's so comfortable and convenient being at home. You can kind of have it on your television, your device, and you can do other things. But it can open an avenue to where we may not give God the full attention he deserves from us. And it could be something that we may miss. So if it's possible, we want to ask you to get your coffee, get your Bible, your Sunday school book, get your pen and a notebook. And let's take some notes, uh, some things that you may be able to jot down. I've always been taught the weakest ink lasts longer than the strongest memory. So 
hopefully that will be somebody out there this morning. So we've made it to 930. If you can take a, a moment, I see Sister Timms is giving the cosign to Black Silk. But if you can take a moment, let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to go directly into Numbers chapter 20. Father, thank you for all of the things you've done. Thank you for all of the things you've been uh, to us, for blessing us, for caring for us, uh, for protecting us. Father, for forgiving us when we've getting, uh, gotten out of line, for bringing us back into the sheepfold. And Father, we thank you for this new day. You told us in your word that your mercies are renewed every morning. Thank you for being a merciful God. Father, we pray that you can cleanse us of our sins. Uh, we put everything into your hands. Help us to live and lead a life that you would be pleased with. And we ask you this morning to help us as we go through your word. Give us an understanding heart. Give us a soft heart. Let your word be planted on fertile ground that you could receive the praise, the honor, and the glory. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Numbers chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. Uh, I will ask you to take notes for those that don't have a memory that may be as good as some other people. That should be all of us. But uh, like I said earlier, the, the weakest ink will last longer than the strongest memory. So remember, uh, this is our final lesson in this uh, particular book. We're going to start our winter quarter uh, the first Sunday of December, next Sunday. So I pray that all of you have your new Sunday school books ready. The lesson this morning is entitled Water from the Rock. And this completes the entire unit. This unit began the fifth Sunday in October all the way up to today, and the unit is entitled Taking God Seriously. And we're going to see this morning how God gave Moses some specific instructions. Moses, out of his passion, his emotion, his anger, well, he did what he wanted to do. He acted out of the flesh. God still blessed the people but God still brought down punishment on Moses, and the punishment was severe. So the lesson in chapter 20, this chapter begins and it ends with death. Uh, in the first verse, we see that Miriam died. By the end of this chapter, we see his brother Aaron died. This chapter is bracketed with the death of Moses' sister, and also Moses' brother. So in verse 1, uh, and I pray that you have your word with you. I, I'm not going to read every verse word for word. But to begin the lesson, uh, then came the children of Israel, the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month. And the people abode in Kadesh. And it gives this kind of subscription. Miriam died there and was buried there. And so, like I said, this chapter begins and ends with death. Moses' sister, she died. We don't know if it was natural causes. We don't know if it was some sickness she was dealing with. This is a note on interpreting scripture where God is silent, then we must be silent. Unless in a parallel story told by another author, we don't know what Miriam died of or what she died from, but Miriam did die. And you can imagine the emotional state of Moses right here. Moses, I'm sure, as he thinks of his sister, as he goes over her, her obituary in his mind, how she was a protector of his when he was a child, how she did put him in that ark on the Nile River, during such a controversial time in Egypt when they were killing all of the children, the midwives were instructed to take the Hebrew children and throw them in the river to drown or to be eaten by the animals or, or in such a horrible way. But she kind of walked in the bull rush. She walked on the shallow parts of the bank and she watched her brother float alone, not knowing what his fate would be, and he floated into the hands of Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter said, take him home back to his mother. 
and when he's of age, bring him to me. That is a part of her narrative. I'm sure Moses heard the story from parents when they told him what his sister did. I'm sure Miriam, who's older than him, she explained that day, maybe around Thanksgiving, we would say in our time, they would sit back and go over stories of old. But also a part of her narrative was she challenged the authority of Moses. Also a part of her narrative, her along with his brother Aaron, they both came up against him. And you know, if everyone has ever been there, or if anyone has ever been there, I'll put it that way, just think of how it is when someone that you love and care for has died, but you have kind of mixed emotions. Maybe when they left, you weren't on the best of terms, or maybe you were on good terms, but you had a spotty history with them. And that's where Moses is. I'm sure he's thinking of the good. I'm sure he's thinking of the bad. I'm sure he's thinking of the laughter. I'm sure he's thinking of the time where she challenged him and he had to pray. God punished her and struck her with leprosy. I'm sure his mind is all over the place, running the full gamut of what he's gone through, good, bad, and indifferent. But now it's all over. And I want to say this when it comes to death. I'm going to say this to you right now. The one thing that I have seen personally that stings people when it comes to death is the finality of it. There is no, I'm going to call next week. There is no, at the family reunion, we'll talk about it. There is no tomorrow as it relates to your relationship with that person because the books are closed. I have seen the situation too many times and too many people have become kind of unraveled in a church service because of death. Not everyone, but sometimes it has to do with the finality of death. I won't be able to have good experiences with them again, which is normal, but I also won't be able to make amends. That's my mother, and I didn't have a good relationship with her. That's my father, and I rebelled against my daddy. That's my whomever. And I did them wrong, and we were in that space when they were taken away and gone to heaven, hopefully gone to heaven, when they died. And the finality of, it's over. It seems to unravel people sometimes. So you can just imagine Moses going up and down with the difficulties in his mind, but he has no time to grieve. Because immediately, there's a national crisis. Verse 2 and verse 3. Not only did Miriam die, verse 1, now we add on to that, there's no water for the congregation. And then the people gathered themselves together. You would love for the end of verse 2 to say, they came together, they prayed, they fell on their faces. They said, Lord, you've been blessing, you've been keeping. We're going to trust you to bless and keep us now. Help us. No. They came together, not for prayer. They came together not to call on God, they came together against Moses and Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and Aaron. And at the end of verse 3, they lay their problems at the feet of Moses and Aaron, saying, y'all have brought us out here to die. Now let's just talk turkey for a moment. All of us, I'm sure, can identify with what I'm about to say. Sometimes you just get sick and tired of being sick and tired. You get tired of hearing the same arguments. You get tired of hearing the same complaints. When we look at Moses and Aaron and any of the individuals in the Bible, we look at them as super believers sometimes. We may mistakenly think of them as these super devoted people, super Christians, super followers of the Lord, super obedient, super sacrificial. These are flawed men and women with the same frailties, make the same mistakes that you and I made. And chances are things that would get on your nerve, things that would get on their nerve. Different time, different season, different culture, but we are all human beings, and the Ecclesiastes says it this way, there's nothing new under the sun. There comes a time 
to where you get sick and tired of hearing the same argument. And here we have Moses hearing a familiar criticism. You don't know what you're doing. You brought us out here to die. We're mad at you for our water shortage. Now, actually, this is the second time that they've experienced a water shortage. God blessed them the first time. This is, I believe, year 38 of their wandering. A whole generation has died off. And now they have water, uh, a, a water shortage again. Now, here's some grace that we may or may not have considered. Living in a desert, living in a hot climate, the grace is that they didn't have more water shortages than what is recorded. You would have thought millions of people, they would have had water shortages all the time. The grace comes in in the fact that God was so gracious, you would have thought it would have happened much more than it really did. So instead of complaining, yes, it's a difficult situation. Every now and then we need to pause and say, well, Lord, let me just say, I thank you that things are as well as they are. I'm not going to ignore the current situation. I'm not going to stick my head in the sand and act as if it's not going on. I see it. I recognize it. I'm experiencing it. But in the midst of this current situation, Lord, it could have been so much worse. Let me learn to say thank you for what you've been doing. And let me learn to praise you for how long you've been blessing. Because if it hadn't been for you, this situation would have been multiplied many times over in my life. But they didn't do this. It says in verse 3, they chode with Moses and Aaron. And see, here's a phrase that I read. I have it right here. I have a book entitled Moses, the Emancipator of Israel. It says, they, people show you they can cheer you today and they can show you tomorrow. And he uses a play on words. Their glorying quickly turned to groaning. Listen, people, for anyone that's ambitious and wanting to be out front and wanting to have the spotlight and wanting to have a position, wanting to have a title, wanting to do this and do that and be the head of so-and-so and such and such, be careful because this is not an easy situation. Moses is dealing with people that are fickle. And I've got two words, and this is in general, two words to describe people. People change. They can hug you today and hate you tomorrow. That's an old country proverb. My aunt used to say that all the time. That little girl over there, she two-faced it. And I, I got what it meant, and that's in proper English, but all of y'all understand what I'm saying. People can love you in the moment, and as soon as the sun goes down and rises again, that situation can change. Moses is dealing with people that are lifting him up at one moment and tearing him down the, mo the next. But then again, it's not that they're really tearing down Moses. It's not that they're really going against Moses. Their true issue is a power struggle with God. God is the one that's been supplying their needs. God is the one that's been leading them through the wilderness. You would have thought that when the 10 spies returned with an evil report and because they had a lack of faith and trust in the Lord and God killed off an entire generation of people in order for this new generation to come up, you would have thought this new generation would have said, I'm not making the mistakes of yesteryear. I'm not going down that road that I saw them travel and I saw how God punished them. I heard the story of God's power. I'm going to take God seriously. No, no. In, in some ways, you can make the argument that this new generation is even more foolish than the past generation because you had a chance to witness what they did and you saw how God punished them. And now here you are walking down the same road, setting yourself up to be punished just like the generation before you. The Bible only gives half of a verse 
to address an atheist. It's in the book of Psalms. It says, the fool says in his heart that there is no God. Well, listen, he may be a fool. They may be a fool, but they're not the biggest fool. The biggest fool is a person who knows that there is a God, but lives as if there is no God. And that's how we can kind of classify the second generation. You mean you know what God can do? You mean you know that God doesn't play? You mean you know that God does not take groaning lightly? And you saw God punish a generation before you? And in your foolishness, you're going to do the same thing over again? That's foolishness. That is foolishness. That's a lesson that many of us as parents have all tried to teach our children. Learn from daddy's mistakes. Learn from mama's mistakes. Learn from your big brother or your big sister's mistakes. You see them going through. You saw, I told you stories of me messing up money. I've told you stories of mama going the wrong way. I'm trying to lay out a template so that you don't have to go through what I went through. So that I can take the benefit of my pain and tell you, don't go down that road. Because if you go down that road, that's going to lead to destruction. And when you see a young person or a child going exactly down the road you said don't go down, the Bible describes that as foolish. Foolishness, let's just talk Bible, is bound up in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction can drive it far from them. Point being is that look at what they're doing. They are still laying their criticism at the foot of of Moses. Moses has no time to grieve. His sister has died. He's got mixed emotions. And now the water is gone. The uh, surprises, you know, didn't come upon God, but the surprise came upon him. And we can see these people, people change. They were cheering him. They were supporting him. They were following God until a problem came. And when a problem came, whatever's on the inside began to show up on the outside. And I'm going to say this before we move on to verses 4 and 5. And let me say this. I, I want us to think about this. There is a blessing associated with pain. There's a blessing associated with difficulties and hardships. And sometimes the blessing is it shows you what's on the inside of you and it shows you what's on the inside of other people around you. You see, when you wake up late and you're running and you, 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 you're trying to get on the road for whatever reason and then you're just about to walk out the house and you say, Lord have mercy, I haven't even brushed my teeth. You go back to the bathroom and you look at that container of toothpaste. It is as flat as a door. So what do you do? You push it. You squeeze it. You bend it. You curve it. You, 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 you twist it with your hand. Because if you squeeze it hard enough, if there's something in there, whatever's in there, guess what? It's going to come out. And that's something that pressure, that suffering, that hard times can do to us when we're put in the squeeze of difficulties whatever's in us is going to come out you see you thought you were through cursing you thought you had patience you thought you were more gracious you thought you could be cool under pressure and maintain your composure but you found out under pressure there's still some stuff in there that need work and you thought you had friends. You thought you had people on your side. You thought you had folks following you, standing with you, standing beside you. But when trouble came, guess what? You found out very quickly that everybody that was around you, they weren't really with you. Everybody that called your name didn't have your best interest at heart. They said they were 100% behind you. But they ended up leaving you and being 100 feet behind you. And here we can see we would have thought this new generation would have been more faithful than the last. 
They would have learned from those mistakes. But yet we find them making the same mistakes that, their, that, that the generation in front of them made. And then they go on in verse 4. They said, you brought us up here to die. Verse 5, you brought us up out of Egypt and brought us to an evil place. There's no seed. Uh, there's no fish, no vine. What they're saying is, they're saying that the land that was promised to us is not what we see. This is not a land flowing with milk and honey. This is not fertile ground. This is a desert. God has tricked us. They aren't saying God. They're saying Moses and Aaron, but truly their accusations lie at the feet of the master because they're actually saying God, who's been leading Moses and Aaron, doesn't know what he's doing. Now, of course, what they're saying is not true. The land is fertile. They even brought back huge pomegranates from the land of Canaan. They're right here at the border of the land of Canaan. They've just barely crossed over. So what they're saying is not true. But when you have a complainer's mentality, when you have a pessimistic outlook, nothing will be good enough. If you're a negative person uh, or a person that has that kind of uh, 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 negative disposition, you can give them $1,000. They'll complain that you gave it to them in a check and not cash. You can give it to them in cash. And they'll complain, say, you should have gave me a check. Somebody might rob me. Nothing will be good enough. We have a way when we complain chronically, consistently, we find a gray cloud in every silver lining, even to the point to where we can deny the obvious blessing that's right in front of us. And just to bring it home, all of us in one way or another, we should be able to identify with this. And I want to ask you just to type this in if this has been something you've experienced. Have you ever been mad and you wanted to stay mad? Even when the situation or person you were mad at removed the reason for your anger and showed you there's no more need to be upset. I fixed it. I've amended it. I've apologized. But have you ever been mad and you just wanted to stay mad? It didn't matter what they said, what they did. They, they've taken away your reason to complain, to be upset, to fuss, and everything else. But you've been mad, and you just wanted to stay mad. And that's kind of how they are, except it's not with anger. It's with complaining. They could have said, look at this photogram. Look at this pomegranate. Look at these figs. What do you mean that this is not a land that has no seed, no figs, no vines, no pomegranate? Yes, it does. But when you're mad and you want to stay mad... It's like trying to ask a locomotive train to stop on the dime. That's why they tell you when that arm comes down over the train track, don't try to beat that train because it takes a train over a mile to come to a complete stop. And that's how it is with complaining. Once that train gets to rolling, it's hard to slow that thing down, even to the point to where people will obviously Pick out the negative, small negative, even when the negative isn't actually actual reality. People can pick out something to still be mad about, or in this case, to still complain about it. So what did Moses and Aaron do? What did they do? They went. Verse 6. What do you mean they went? And Moses and Aaron went. They, they, they went? What do you mean? Moses and Aaron did something that was exceptionally wise. They shut their mouths and they left from the congregation of the assembly. The presence, excuse me, of the assembly. And they went to the door of the tabernacle. They said, we're not going to stand here and get into a shouting match to argue with them about what they are saying, which is obviously untrue and obviously said from a malicious heart, from a complaining spirit. Because nothing we say is going to change or calm them down. 
So what did they do? They left the people and they went to the tabernacle. They left the earthly carnal individuals. Didn't talk to them, but they went to God and talked to God about it. They went to the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the makeshift tent that the Korahite, uh, Korah and those who were swallowed alive last week, they would erect it and they would disassemble it. They would assemble it. They would disassemble it. They were charged with carrying it. The tabernacle was set up. And the tabernacle is the place that God appointed to where he would meet them and they would have a place of worship. They left and didn't speak to the people, but they went and talked to God about it. Two things we want to examine, according to verse 6. When you get into these moments, and here you got Moses, his sister just died. He's dealing with the ups and downs emotionally of their checkered history together. Yes, he loved her, but they didn't always have a lovable situation. He might even be looking side-eye at Aaron right now, saying, yeah, she came against me once. You were with her one occasion. But I digress, Aaron. Come on, let's go pray. They, Moses is in a very fragile emotional state. And Moses kept his mouth shut because in that moment, Everyone has been there. If you're not careful, you're going to say something that you can't take back. This is some extreme wisdom. Moses said, I'm not going to argue with these people because in my arguing with these people, I can feel it on the tip of my tongue. I'm going to mess around and say something that I don't need to say. So instead of talking to the people, instead of getting in an argument with the people, Moses went and talked to God about it. They went and fell on their faces before the Lord. And God gave them instruction. And even with us, I've preached this uh, title before. It's not from, it may have been from this particular text. Hush until you heal. Depending on the situation. If, if it's one of those moments to where, you know, you, you, you can't win for losing. When it rains, it pours. You've had several things pile up on top of you. And now you get these false accusations and critics and, and, and nonsense in your face. Keep your mouth closed. Separate yourself. If you can. We don't always have that luxury of removing ourselves from a situation, depending on the nature of the problem, the extent of the problem, what's happening, where it's happening, who's involved. We may not always have this luxury. But friend, if you have a way to just steal away, if you have an opportunity to get away, even if you don't have an opportunity to physically leave, if you have to stay there, the wisest thing I can tell you is to be quiet. I've been in this place many, 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 more times than I would care to be in it. To the point to where you're talking to someone and the conversation just gets personal. And then it gets unreasonable. And they won't even listen to basic facts. And what do I do? Quiet. I've even had it said to me, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm just, I'm not adding anything. I'm not, and I've had people talk themselves into a frenzy. I'm not being a part of it. I, mm -mm, I'm not going to disrespect you, hang up in your face. I'm not going to be rude. I'm not, I've tried to talk. I've tried to reason. I've tried to pray. I've tried to interject the Bible. Uh -uh, forget all that Bible talk. Be quiet. Be quiet. Hush until, because if you get into an arguing match, a shouting match, normally that kind of stuff doesn't get resolved. Real situations don't get resolved that way. So rather than go back and forth with the people, they went and fell upon their faces at the tabernacle. And it says, and the Lord showed up. And what we see in verses 8 and following is that God is never out of options. This may have taken them by surprise, but it did not take God by surprise. So what did God say, beginning in verse 8? and Actually, it's in verse 8. God said, I tell you what, get everybody together. Verse 8. Get your brother Aaron. 
go in front of that rock and speak to it in front of their eyes. And when you speak to that rock, it's going to give water. It's going to, water's going to come from that rock. It's going to be so much water that the people, which is, I believe, close to 2 million people, if not more, and their livestock will have enough. Now, you're talking donkeys, oxen. This, this has to be a huge amount of water. But, but I want us to pay attention to verse 8. Because God is never out of solution. God is never caught by surprise. They show their wisdom in not arguing because they can say something potentially that they can't take back. So they say, I'm not going to argue. I'm going to pray. I'm not going to fuss. I'm going to pray. I'm not going to shout. I'm going to talk to God. I'm going to pray. And God gives them instruction. Now, notice the instructions. Take the rod. That means you got to grab it. Get the people together. Get them together. And speak to the rock. So, so, so wait. God is saying, I'm going to bless you, but your deliverance is tied to your duty. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to do my part. But you still have a part to play as well. Not that your part is grander and greater than my part. Because the true source is me. But our deliverance sometimes is tied to our duty to the Lord. Well, well, well what do you mean? If you're unemployed... Should you pray for God to give you an adequate source of employment? Yes. But that doesn't mean you pray and start watching TV. As the seniors would say, put some grease in your hair, shine your shoes, iron your shirt, and get out there and start looking. Pray, God, I need you. God, lead me. But while you're praying, you're also looking. Your deliverance could be tied to your duty. Your deliverance could be tied to your devotion to the Lord. So God says, I'm going to deliver everybody because having a water shortage in a hot, humid climate is a serious thing. Now, God has been graciously blessing them all these years to where this is only the second time this has happened. Should have been and could have been more had God not been providing for them so graciously. But yet God said, here's what I want you to do. You do your part and then you trust me and watch me do my part. God is never out of solutions. So then what happens? Moses, he starts off well, verse 9. He took the rod. He gets the rod. The rod was not meant to be a bat. It was not meant to be a show-off piece. It was a symbol of his authority. It was a symbol, a token, as it were, that this is my called man because his authority has been challenged several times. And Moses, verse 10, he calls the people together. And then Moses in verse 10, he starts talking to the people. Whoa, stop, stop, stop. God did not tell you to say a word to those people. Apart from getting them together, there may have been some words, hey, come together, y'all, come together. But as far as giving a specific message to them, God did not tell him to say a word to those people. God didn't, God, mm -mm, don't say a word. God, mm -mm, God, he just deviated from what God said. L -l Listen, re remember in the Gospels, uh, there was a blind man and Jesus told the blind man after he healed him and gave him his sight, Jesus told him, don't tell anybody that I've done this. And he said, I won't tell anybody. And then he leaves and when he leaves, he just couldn't help it. He just started telling everybody, it was Jesus who gave me my sight. Many people try to give that blind man whose sight was restored, they try to give him a pass. They said, now come on, cut him some slack. I mean, the man has been blind his entire life. I mean, and I've heard people preach it. I said I wasn't going to tell it, 
but I just can't keep it to myself. Well, listen, people, that's wrong. That is not weakness. That is still wickedness. If God says, don't say something, the means don't, or the end don't justify the means. He couldn't help it. He just had to tell it. You just had to disobey. Put that mindset on other situations. Thou shalt not steal. But I couldn't help it. I just had to take that money. Thou shalt not lie. I couldn't help it. I just had to make up a lie and bring them down. I was so tempted to lie. I just couldn't. I mean, give me some slack. They talk about me all the time. Let me talk about them. This company doesn't need this money. What are they going to do with this $1,000? This is a million-dollar corporation. I said I wasn't going to take it. But I just had to do it. The government don't need this money. They buying bombs and planes and nuclear. I can use this money better than they can. It's still disobedience. And here we see Moses disobeyed. God told Moses, here's what I want you to do. Follow my instructions to the T. Don't deviate. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. As soon as he spoke to the people, he disobeyed. He veered off the path. Listen, when you, for those of you who's had to travel, and you look at your plane ticket, you're, you know, you're leaving. You may have gate A1. And then right beside gate A1 is gate A2. Now, if you look at your ticket and say, well, gate A1, I mean, what's wrong with going to gate A2? They're right here beside each other. One misstep like that can have you on the other side of the country. You see, if you don't follow the instructions on your ticket, here's the gate. Here's the flight time. Here's your arrival time. Here's your return time. Here's where you're going to come through. Here's the airport. Here's the gate you come back to Little Rock National Airport in. If you just miss one letter, one number, A1 to A2, it can put you on opposite ends of the country. And here we have Moses. Well, he's he just speaking to the people. It's not even what he said. You see, because he wouldn't have called them rebels. rebels. He wouldn't have said, do we got to fetch water from this rock from you? This never would have happened if he would have kept his mouth shut in the first place. So let's just trace this back to its source. Let's not try to be an advocate for Moses and say, after all he went through, after all he's going through, his sister just died. They're talking about him again. They're criticizing him. Well, that's what prayer is for. He prayed. And God gave him instructions. And guess what he did? He veered away from the beaten path. He didn't do what God said do. What sense does it make to go to the doctor and they say, your blood pressure is high. You need to do A, B, C, and X, Y, Z. Uh-oh, that, that elbow ligament is pulled. You need to wear a, a sling for so many days and so much at night and sleep this way. What sense would it make to receive the instructions from the doctor and then say, that doctor don't know what he's talking about. I'm not taking that medicine. I'm not going to change this. I'm not going to wear a sling. Well, what'd you go for? And we can go to Moses. What did you pray for? If you didn't want to argue, if you knew it was unwise to get into a shouting match, if you saw they were being unreasonable and malicious and just downright mean, so you prayed and God told you what to do, what is the use of praying if you're not going to do what the Lord said do? Let's make an application. What's the use of being with us this morning if you're still going to live the way you want to live? What's the use of reading your Bible if you're going to say, well, I'll do this, but I'm not going to do that? I mean, look at Moses. Moses, he gathered the people. Okay, got that. He took the rod. Okay, I got that. And God was like, be quiet and speak to the rock. That's the only speaking you do. Well, I'm not going to do that. I got to get mine off. I have to say something to this congregation. Do you know what I'm going through? No. You see, the moment that you veer from what God says is the moment that you don't get the blessing that God has uh, um, said you would have. Now listen, he calls them rebels. He says, I'm not your maid. I'm not your personal assistance. Why am I having to fetch you water from the rock? Verse 11, he lifts up his hand with the rod, and he doesn't even speak to the rod. He hits it, not once, but twice. But then there's a blessing. Water still came out. 
abundant water came out. God still did what he said he was going to do. He gave enough water for the beast, enough water for all the congregation. And then God speaks to Moses and Aaron, verses 12 and 13. He said, I'm not going to punish them. I'm not going to cause them to miss out because of you. But I am going to punish you. I'm going to, be, he said, the reason you did that, this is God speaking, verse 12. It's not so much out of anger, not so much out of revenge and vengeance. The reason you did that is because you didn't believe me, verse 12. You didn't trust me. You did not think that I would be able to do this, and you did not sanctify me in the eyes of Israel. And because of that, both of you will not be able to take this congregation into the land of Canaan. Now, there are some people that try to say God is mean. I mean, come on, God, cut them some slack. You know how many people try to say the blind man was just so excited. He couldn't help. He couldn't help. He had to say something. I know God said be quiet, but I mean, cut the man some slack. Listen, God is fair. God is just. God is holy. Yes, he's merciful, but he's just. Yes, he's patient and forgiving, but he hold, he's holy. The justice of God demands that we obey him. We're not free to use a football term here. We're not free to come to the line of scrimmage and call an audible. I mean, God, I would tell him this. But this is 2021. People don't really believe that. They don't follow that. I'll come under criticism. So let me help you out, God. I won't tell them this. I won't preach that. Where if I do, I'll soften it. You see, you got to soften it, God. God, you got to catch the fish before you clean them. So I can't give a hard message. People don't want to come to church and hear A, B, C, X, Y, Z. If God's word says it, we are not to deviate from it. Even in preaching, it matters not what is in and out in the culture. It matters not how far the world has strayed away from God and a hardline biblical message would be rejected. That's just part of the package. And here we see God saying, Moses, I love you. You know I love you. I protected you and stood up for you many times. In our lesson just last week, Moses, that was me that validated you as my chosen spokesman against Korah and all those other 250 men. I opened up the ground and swallowed them alive in the pit and closed the ground, thus proving to any and everyone else, you're my guy. You are the person that I'm backing. And after all I've done for you, you get to this point and you don't trust me. You don't believe me. You won't glorify me in the face of these people. He said, Moses, I love you, but because I love you, that doesn't mean I don't punish you. And we've got to get away from this as I get ready to close here. We've got to stray away from putting certain portions of God's character on, uh, on steroids and emphasizing them over and over to the detriment of others. God is loving. God is patient. God is merciful. God is kind. God is fair. But he's also just. It, it, it's not just a whole bunch of icing. No, there's some vegetables in here too. Yes, he'll love you out of your sin. Yes, he's the God of another chance. But he's also the God you need to take seriously. So don't trifle with God. God here says, I love, li li listen, this can even, and, and I love using this example because many people can relate to it. Child rearing. Love your child. But if you never discipline your child, if you never put any restrictions up or corporal punishment or add chores or takeaway privileges, if you never put up any guardrails when your child does good, all you do is love them and play with them and hug them, no, you're going to have a child with weak character. You're going to have a child that won't really obey you. 
And if they don't obey mama and daddy, who's the highest authority, a teacher can give it up. A security guard has no chance. A police officer, when he says stop, put your hands in the air, or pull over, huh? they're so used to getting their way because mama and daddy never put guardrails up. So my point is, you love your child, but you still have to discipline them. And that's out of love. God loved Moses and Aaron, but he still had to discipline them. God loves us, but whom the Lord loves, he corrects. And God had to correct their bad behavior by saying, you forfeited the privilege of leading them into the land of Canaan. You won't be able to do it. Now, keep in mind, God did this as a result of what they had done first. God didn't initiate this. He's only responding to their behavior. Another way we can see that God is still loving. So the lesson concludes basically with this. The, the name of the place in verse 13 is changed to Mirabah uh, because it's a place where the people strove or argued with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. But just keep in mind, God is a God of grace, a God of mercy, but he's also a God of judgment. He's also a God, as our unit says, that we should take seriously. Don't box with heaven because your arms are too short. So amen. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your support, even by your presence this morning. Uh, to the members of New Hebron, uh, please don't neglect as we move into the holiday season and we're closing the year out, please don't neglect to honor God in your giving. I know we have so many people we want to show we love with gifts and trinkets and things, and I'm sure people are shopping and all sorts of other things, but don't push God out of the way because it's God that gives us the ability to do all these other things. So to the members of New Hebrew, we want to encourage you to remember God in your giving, to remember, to honor him. Uh, to support New Hebron uh, with your financial obligations. That way we can make sure that we can continue ministry as we go forward. So I pray that God will keep you safe. Uh, we'll be back in about 20 minutes or so, and we'll start, uh, con not conclude, we'll continue with our sermon series entitled The Hard Realities of Serving the Lord. And this morning, we're going to talk about one that's very hard. We're going to talk about, I'm, I'm not going to give it away, but yeah. We're going to talk about something hard that God tells us, commands us to do, whether we want to or not. It's still a command. So I can't wait to see you then. Hope to see all of you back again. God bless you and God keep you until we meet again.